And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, co creator of the upcoming TTRPG known as Lightspeed. Which, I'll give you guys a bit of a guess as to what that's going to be about. <laughs> the, one, the one and only Grady Tarlin. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. So, I'll start, I'd like to start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Okay. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Okay, so... Uh... Uh, the first role-playing game I ever played was D and D Fourth uh, Edition, <laughs> everybody's favorite edition. Ah, um, yes the <laughs> the edition I'm the edition I'm told I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because the check didn't clear. Yeah, um, yeah, and then you know I graduated up to Fifth Edition. That was all in like uh, like middle school and high school and stuff. And um, yeah, after after a few years of playing D and D uh, and loving it. Um, I love the world building side of like being the dungeon master and creating all my own like unique like universes and stuff. Um, and eventually, it came to a point where my friends were kind of looking for a to a bit of a change of pace. So we were thinking like, oh, I wonder if there's any cool like sci-fi role playing games we could we could try out. Um, but we were all kind of a little lazy about it. Like we were looking for like what's like something really easy to learn because we didn't really have the the willpower to go out and like get familiar with one of the more like chunky like crunchy systems um so we like we found some real like quick like one page rpg things uh that we thought we could try out and then we like played some of those and it was like ah oh, one page does not really give enough space to have a fully fledged rule set and stuff so uh kind of based off of that experience i just decided that yeah, you know, I, I love the world building enough that I might just try my hand at making my own game. So I actually have relatively little experience with other role playing games. Like I've mm -hmm. played, I'm just big on D and D and stuff. But um, yeah, I haven't really tried out too many indie games myself, which is a little bit ironic considering that I'm publishing one now. But yeah, that's how I got into the scene. Yeah, and with now. With that in with that in mind, it's certainly a bit of it's certainly quite a jump to go from high to go from whatever sort of fantasy D and D wants to be this week yeah. to um spit to full on space opera, which is the vibe that I get with um light speed. What of all these genres to go to when you were getting kind of kind of tired of D and D's um, particularities? What made you want to go with space opera? Well. I think one of the things I loved about D&D &D so much was that uh, it's kind of a creative sandbox in many ways, especially if you're willing to kind of work more homebrew stuff in there. So, like, I had played D&D &D campaigns of, of every sort of fantasy subgenre out there, like more like gothic horror stuff and high fantasy, low fantasy. Like, all that stuff kind of fits under the D&D &D umbrella. So I, I wanted to accomplish a... A similar thing with Lightspeed, that like to fit in a lot of sci-fi subgenres into this like grander galaxy. Um, the galaxy is called Regnum. Uh, that Lightspeed is set in. So depending on like which region of the galaxy you're looking at, uh, it it sort of falls into different subgenres. So like some of the regions have been designed more towards like a cyberpunk feel, or like a space western, or as you said, space opera. Um, like the creativity and the and the the flexibility uh, of the game is something I really wanted to maintain throughout the whole design process. Mm -hmm. um, it was really important for me. So, yeah, I tried to work in as many genres as I could, and find a place for everything. I do find it kind of amusing that you have a bit of a comic book style tutorial in the um, quick start that's on itch. Yeah. Yeah, I've always loved making comics and illustrating and stuff so it felt like a, a good way to kind of introduce the whole the whole game mm -hmm. um I, I like that rpgs can be almost a, a cinematic experience if you have a vivid enough imagination so i felt that like 
comics are kind of the closest you can get to that on a, like in a book format. So that would be a good thing to include. Yeah. And when it comes to the, the other, the other large leap is going from the granularness of the D20 system to using 2D6. Yeah. So much like how I asked about, about what made you want to go with uh, space opera, what made you want to go with a 2D6 as your primary resolution mechanic? I am glad you asked, actually, because um, there's there's a few things other than just genre that, like, uh, even after years of playing D and D, I couldn't quite. It's not that I couldn't understand it. It's just that it takes a long time to learn all the rules and mechanics and stuff. And like introducing new players to D and D is always a little bit of a headache of just like explaining all these different uh, like granular skills and like what all these defenses do and saving throws and ability scores versus skills and stuff. And there's there's so many layers of stats and stuff that it's it's very daunting for a new person to get into. So one of my goals with Lightspeed was to make it a lot more beginner friendly than that. Um, so I've kind of boiled down, uh, the experience to eight core skills. There's just skills, no ability scores. Um, and the first version of Lightspeed I made did have a D20 system, like with all the, all the polyhedral dice and stuff. But, um, the more I worked on it, the more I realized that working it down to this 2D6 system made it even more accessible potentially. Um. I know, like every every RPG player has their beloved dice collection, but uh, people who aren't really in that scene yet are more likely to have their hands on some some normal D6s. So that was just one of the ways I wanted to make the game a little more accessible to people who aren't like super familiar with the the whole world yet. Mm-hmm. So. Now the other th- the other thing I found interesting is the skill check is the skill check results, mm-hmm. uh, where the where the die th- where the die that's rolled can determine, um, can determine the tier of success if it if any success. Mm-hmm. Um, what I was kind of reminded of is the universal result approach that you see in Powered by the Apocalypse, and I'm curious if that was an influence. Um, well, yeah, funnily enough, as I mentioned before, I don't have a ton of experience with indie RPGs, so um, I, my my toolbox of, of game mechanics, like my mental uh, toolbox is pretty limited, so uh, most of the things in here are just things that seemed like a good idea to me at the time, and I'm sure there's a ton of overlap with other games out there that I just haven't seen before, but um, yeah, I just felt like... Like when I played D and D, and like you, you roll a, a nineteen or whatever to like hit a goblins. Like obviously you hit them, but it feels like you should have some sort of additional reward on top of just just the successful hit, rather than it's just one hit, uh, as opposed to like there should be some like some relative like increase in like how good of a result you get based on how high your roll is i guess so like a a 19 should get you something better than if you just rolled like one above its armor class so yeah i wanted to have like just the better the the better you roll the better you do is basically it it just seemed to make the most sense to me and the most intuitive way to handle things Mm -hmm. um yeah now with that, with that, in, with that in mind, uh, I do, I do appreciate that there, that um, that there is a very symbol-based approach as well as well as the sprite work that's in the main book. Um, was a lot of that just to just to help um, people remember cer- remember certain things. Yeah, I think imagery is super important. Uh, like just for yeah remembering how all the mechanics work like if there's a little symbol you can you can associate with like like all of the skills for example have a little icon uh associated with them um and that just kind of helps cement those those mechanics into your brain but also i kind of use it as like a little visual shorthand when i'm making like characters or anything i'll just write their bonus and then rather than writing out the whole like i'll write down the whole word engineering like i'll just draw the little wrench symbol that that uh indicates i'm talking about engineering Mm -hmm. 
Now, one thing. Now, um, I had also noticed that you have um, both races and sub races for e for each of the setups. I'm guessing that I'm guessing that was to make it so that that um, races aren't a mono instance, for lack of a better term. Yeah. So there's there's a kind of a lot of ideas like from the whole realm of sci-fi that I wanted to work into the into the game, but. Um, some of them had, they had like kind of varying levels of like detail. Like I wanted to have robots um, and there's a lot of different kinds of robots. So I didn't want to like the race to just be called robot. Um, so I have the Android sub race, which is like robots that look like people. And then I have Husk sub race, which is more classic, like R2D2 style, like utility robot. Um, so yeah, as with everything in the game, that's gone through many iterations, but yeah, I've settled on uh, the races and sub races, and it was also important for me to distinguish, like, have a little variety in the alien races. Um, the alien races aren't available in the free version, but they're coming out in the ultimate edition, which is on Kickstarter now. Mm -hmm. And the other, if I'm not mistaken, with with um the approach that they, that you have with it is. A, your choice of race is going to grant a skill bonus as well as a couple um, a couple features. One from your race and one from your sub-race. Exactly. And that does, br that does bring me to the class system that you have, which is interesting since the the amount of ga the amount of indie games that that are going to use a class system are somewhat in a min are somewhat in a minority. Most people want to go freeform, especially when it comes to space opera. But you ended up going with with um classes going and going with um just five of them. Yeah, so that's that's one of the things I, I really liked is RPGs, especially when I was younger, is just like that you get to you kind of pick this combo of like, I want to be a robot hunter or like a human pilot or something. It's just mm -hmm. like a nice, easy, short way to kind of give a, a synopsis of what your character is like without uh, having to like describe much about them. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the classes... Though you do pick a class, it doesn't it doesn't nail you down to one approach, so to speak. Uh, especially because as you progress uh, in the game and like level up a few times, you have the opportunity to choose class features from classes other than your own. So, like, let's say you're a hunter at level three, you get to pick a tier one class feature from any class. So even if you're a hunter and you're like mostly kind of stealth oriented, you can always still like let's say pick a tech class feature to help you with uh, like working on machines or whatever um, just so you can kind of flesh out your character and not get pigeonholed into one kind of role mm -hmm. but with with that in mind I'd like to I'd like to go through each of the main classes and what's and what sort of play style it's bringing to the table if you don't mind Absolutely. So, uh, I'll also mention that uh, in the in the ultimate edition that's coming to Kickstarter, there's there's two new classes, which are the Catalyst and the Mutant. So we can talk about that stuff later, though. We yeah. can start with the, the well, core five. So starting from the top, the Heavy. Yeah, so the Heavy is the main sort of combat focus class. Um, the action in Lightspeed is, is very flexible, and combat is not sort of the the be-all, end-all action sequence kind of thing that you can do. So um, for me, I wasn't super concerned about the classes being balanced uh, all like within the same arena, so to speak. So like heavies are kind of undeniably the best combat class. Like they have the best weapons, the best armor. That's sort of their, their role in the team. The role idea is kind of what I was going for with the classes more so than uh, anything else. Um, I just wanted them to to each have their own kind of area where they shine. So yeah, the heavy they have like grenades, like bulletproof vests and stuff. And then as you get more and more powerful, you get stuff like uh, power armor kind of thing, and like rocket mm -hmm. launchers and that sort of fun stuff. Mm -hmm. so moving now, down the list. Yeah, moving down the moving down the list, we have the hunter. 
Yeah, so the hunter is kind of like your your stealth class in many ways. Um, uh, so they're very good at you know sneaking around uh, as well as like mobility type stuff. Um, so uh, they have like you have like your your grappling hook kind of thing, or like a, a Xeno Beast companion is one of their early features. Um, so yeah, hunters are are good at uh, sort of investigation type work. So like a like a bounty hunter, or like a detective or something mm -hmm. that could fall under the hunter category, as well as like assassins and thieves and stuff. So anyone who's good at sneaking around and breaking into places. In other words, this is the class for those who say, yes, I have seen The Mandalorian. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Anyone who wants to live that dream, yeah. Um, pilot. Pilots, yeah. So uh, a big thing in Lightspeed is, is vehicle action. Um, so vehicles are like, there's all kinds of vehicles, and they're very customizable with different modules. So I, I wanted to have a class that, that focuses on, on vehicle action a lot and that would be the pilot of course um so one of, one of my challenges in designing this class was trying to find a way to make them like awesome in in vehicle combat but also still have a use when they're on foot um and the way that i kind of went about that was making them sort of like risk oriented like they're 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 the daredevil class sort of mm -hmm. they're they they thrive off of like taking risks and having those risks pay off. Um, so each each class has a, a class ability, so I can describe those. Mm -hmm. So the the heavies class ability is whenever they succeed on a shooting check, they can make a free fighting check. So that makes them way better than most other classes at, at anything combat related because they're just making more attacks per turn. Um, whereas the hunter, they have a similar ability, which is whenever they succeed on a stealth check, they can make a free athletics check. So that lets them like really quickly and quietly like break into places or like sneak up behind someone. And athletics is also used for throwing weapons. So uh, it, it still helps them in combat, um, but just kind of in a different way. Uh, and the pilot has a, has a very different one. They have probably the most unique one out of any of the five base classes. Uh, their class ability, Maneuver, lets them make a free skill check whenever an enemy targets them with a skilled contest and fails. So let's say they're they're flying a, a fighter jet mm -hmm. uh, and the enemy starship is shooting at them and the enemy misses, then the, the pilot immediately gets to, kind of as a reaction, uh, turn around and make a skill check of any kind. So, so they could do a, a flip and start shooting back or they could take the opportunity to quickly make another piloting check and and lose their their pursuers mm -hmm. uh it's kind of up to them yeah uh, so next on the list is tech tech yeah so being a sci-fi game technology is obviously a, a huge component of all the all the adventures so techs are the ones who are maintaining building inventing modifying and upgrading that technology so text could be anything from like a mechanic to a hacker to like a, a biologist uh, so yeah their features all kind of revolve around uh making engineering checks uh so their their ability is that whenever you succeed on an engineering check your next check gains advantage uh so advantage in light speed means uh you roll 3d6 for your skill check and you keep the highest two results so mm -hmm. getting advantage is what a lot of the class features kind of revolve around mm -hmm. um so yeah Techs are basically just, they're making engineering checks to, like, repair your starship or upgrade your weapon in some capacity or meddle with the enemy's technology. And then once they succeed on that, they can then go on to do something else with uh, with a little more uh, success. Mm -hmm. And lastly, the trader. Yeah, so the trader is the, is the social kind of character they're they're charisma based so i wanted to have trader as sort of like as as a D, &D player i guess i always wanted to have a class that was not as as combat focused so they're i guess traders are oops uh traders you, are kind you of wanted like a the, diplomancer yeah exactly they're, they're kind of like the bard of light speed in, in many ways um yeah, so, except they don't suck yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so their their ability is is like the tech one but it's whenever they succeed on a charisma check they get advantage 
advantage on their next skill check. So a lot of their features uh, focus on uh, just making money uh, as well as like influencing other characters. And they also have like a lot of like hologram based stuff to do some, some trickery. Mm -hmm. That's a fun class for sure. Yeah. Although um, I did I did note that when it comes to when it comes to weaponry, you you add um you only you only have three categories that be that being um, light, heavy, and special. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So uh, the reason I, I handled weapons like that was because I found that a lot of like new players when they sit down for a, a role playing game. Um, especially the ones with like a lot of creative energy, they don't want to just like pick something off a list. They want to like be like, what, what if my weapon was like a a big laser gun that turns people into frogs when it hits them, or like what if it was like a, a rope dart with a poisonous tip, or like a just uh, carry a bunch of tiny bombs with me or something. And I found that if if you make like a preset list of weapons that people can choose from. It's very limiting. So I decided to just kind of make it a lot more broad of you choose. Uh, it's more like you, you just choose whether you want a kinetic weapon or an energy weapon. So it'd be like a, mm -hmm. like a normal bullet pistol versus like a laser pistol, for example. And then the three categories just determine how much damage it does. It's so like a light weapon would be something small, like a knife or a pistol. A uh, heavy weapon would be like a, a battle axe or a or a shotgun, and then a special weapon would be something that does the most damage. So it'd be something crazy like uh, nanite destroyer, or like antimatter, you know, artillery cannon or something. And there's all there's also only three categories because uh, in in light speed your characters only have three health, so. Uh, a special weapon theoretically can just instantly kill someone, um, and that that your health can be upgraded with uh, armor and shields. Um, but I didn't want any weapons that do like a ridiculous amount of damage, just instantly obliterate anyone. Um, you also just don't need that many categories when the there's kind of a low ceiling of of how high your defenses can get. So combat tends to get resolved very quickly in light speed because. Either you kill the enemies really fast, or they start killing you and you <laughs> choose to run away, basically. Mm -hmm. It's got high stakes. So, the ne the next thing that I, wa that I wanted to I wanted to go into is what is... Where you draw the line between, some, between a heavy weapon and a special weapon? Um, I guess that's honestly kind of mostly up to interpretation uh it's, it's kind of it determines like how much damage it does and how much it costs but other than that it's all kind of a matter of imagination so what i classify as a he heavy weapon would be something like a just like a two-handed weapon basically it, it doesn't like limit the amount of checks you can make with it or anything but um like i would describe a like a great sword or a machine gun or like a assault rifle sniper rifle any any like big weapon that uh, takes both hands to use and uh or even not necessarily like you could have a heavy revolver if you want and it would still do two damage but yeah it's just kind of a matter of like rarity and uh value more than anything else so tr so the bfg would have to be treated as a special weapon got it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, I suppose I suppose the I suppose the exact same thing could be could be utilized with the noisy cricket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I bring it's, it's I bring up, kind of big... I bring up the noisy cricket a lot, but that's because it's a reliable ca case of a ridiculously powerful but ridiculously unsafe weapon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that kind of example is exactly why I kind of went with the system that I chose. Is just because like. Like in a fantasy setting, the bigger your weapon, the better it is generally. But in sci-fi, like with really high tech, you can kind of miniaturize even very powerful weapons. So I didn't want to like distinguish it by having like one-handed versus two-handed weapons because of like the noisy cricket kind of thing. Of like you could have a 
a nuclear bomb and a nuclear bomb in the in the palm of your hand mm-hmm. uh and i didn't want to like take away from that by with with any restrictive rules no we've we've already seen what happens at at the end of discount dan's rent a nuke program <laughs> uh now one of the one of the other major things that you're that you're giving emphasis emphasis to is vehicles mm-hmm. uh since you have the and it's you have three stats with it that being speed hull and um capacity yep. along right. along with thumbs along with energy yeah so yep. um i guess one thing one thing i'm curious about is when it comes to vehicles obviously Obviously, ship obviously ships count under that, but could personal conveyance count under this vehicle system as well? Yeah, absolutely. So there's there's a few kind of size categories of vehicles. Um, the smallest of which is air cruisers. So air cruisers include air speeders, which is just like your classic kind of speeder bike thing, and then air cars, which would be like a like a Blade Runner style flying car, and then air ships as well, which is kind of bigger but still more like atmosphere bound and then uh above that is starships so starting with light starships that's like fighters and corvettes and shuttles so like still kind of personal use uh vehicles but like capable of going into space um and then you just keep moving up from there size size wise so heavy starships are things that like would be a, a huge like a huge compared to like a car i guess um it would have like a big crew and can mm-hmm. support like a lot of high-tech weapons and stuff and then the the final largest category is galactic uh starships so those are like the really big like flagships uh, or like mother ships that would have dreadnoughts like, yeah exactly yeah so they'd have like the biggest weapons and the, mm-hmm. the fanciest modules yeah and it looks it looks like each each module it does re- it looks like the relationship between modules and ener- and energy is you need and en- you need energy to in order to power modules for for a ship up exactly. to up to its capacity but in but in order and in order to get more in order to get more energy that could that can be handled through adding reactors Exactly. Yeah. So uh, the the capacity actually refers to the cargo capacity, like the amount of uh, people and like bulk resources uh, resources that you can you can transport in your ship. Mm-hmm. So something like a freighter has like a lot of capacity because it's kind of designed for uh, transporting cargo, whereas like a, a frigate, which is more of like a combat ship, uh, would emphasize like hull and energy, so it can have a lot of like armor and weapons uh, rather than like a lot of cargo space. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, you can you can buy reactors to improve your energy, uh, which then lets you get more and fancier modules. Yeah. Um, so a lot of modules like upgrade these stats. Like if you want to have a really high capacity for cargo in your frigate, you can always get a like a cargo bay, which is a module. So just as long as you have the spare energy for it, you can kind of customize your ship to suit your needs. Yeah. Now, given given that, and given and given the fact that you have an entire class based around based around trade. I would like to go into how you're going how you're going to be handling that. Right. So that's uh, one of the things I've been working on a lot recently. Actually, um, you may notice that the the resource trading section in the in the main handbook is is fairly short. Um, mm-hmm. It just describes like a few different types of of bulk resources that you can get, like uh, just materials, goods, and then biotech. Uh, so. Like each of those is a few examples that describe kind of the average value of, of a unit of like a bulk unit of resources. Um, yeah, it's definitely, that's kind of just there to, to give traders a little extra something to do, uh, like a little bit of like resource management. Um, so one of the things I'm working on right now for future content is a, an animator's guide. Mm-hmm. Um, and in Lightspeed, the game master is called an animator because they they bring the universe to life. Mm-hmm. Um, so within that, I'm I'm working on uh, a lot of like base building mechanics, uh, including like 
uh, costs for like constructing your own facilities. So like you can make a factory that produces goods so you can get goods for a, a lower price. And then like depending on where your base is, uh, there'll be different like shortages and like abundances. So for example, uh, like a planet, like a living planet like Earth would have an abundance of biotech because there's life forms everywhere. Um, but it would have a shortage of uh, finished goods because like there's a big population with a big demand for it. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you look at something like a space station, uh, that would have uh, an abundance of finished goods because they can be manufactured uh, with no gravity, which is a lot cheaper. Um, but on the other hand, they would have a shortage of raw materials because being in space, they can't do any mining or anything. Um, so basically that whole system is just like you can you, with your you, you take your your ship you load it up at a like you go to a space station where you can get a, a lot of bulk goods for for cheap prices load up there and take them down to the surface of a planet where you can then sell them for much more than you bought them for so it's kind of like you can you can be an interplanetary merchant or something and like make a lot of money fast and buy like a whole fleet of starships and hire some crews and kind of expand your, your galactic empire. Mm -hmm. Now in, in the midst of, in the midst of all this, I had, I had completely glossed over the fact that you mentioned two other classes that are going to be in the full book. And just okay. so it, just so I don't end up um, having that hang over my head afterwards, I'd like to dip into those and what they're going to be bringing to the table. Awesome, for sure. Yeah, so uh, the first new class is the Catalyst. Uh, so that's kind of your 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 mystic sort of thing, um, like your, your Jedi, your Sith, that kind of thing, like anyone with magical abilities of some kind. Uh, so Catalysts have uh, features that like revolve around... Uh, spirits and like time manipulation as well as like energy projection and stuff um so yeah it's definitely a, a very popular and fun class to play as um and the other one is mutant uh so mutants are kind of like biotechnology based um mm -hmm. someone who's been who's been corrupted or perhaps even enhanced with uh with aberrant biotechnology or, or radiation or, or whatever you want to work into your backstory um mm -hmm. mutants have a lot of uh they're they're kind of like a secondary combat class like they're they would have the the best chances of fighting against a heavy um they have stuff that like they can regenerate health and go into like a blood rage and get like retractable claws and stuff even wings at at first level you can have a pair of wings um, mm -hmm. and yeah, they have, they have more features like that, uh, which a pair of wings sounds nice, except, except when you realize most ships aren't exactly known for having a whole lot of space for lack of a yeah. better term. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, you, you'd want to be looking to spend some time on planets if you're, if you're rocking the wings, but Yeah. You could also, if, if the wings fail you, you can always get a jet pack as a pilot, so you've got yeah. options for flying around. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, which does make me wonder if you if if you have a pilot who's who's in in say in say power armor, if you'd count that as piloting just as much as piloting a ship. Um, so there, there's some kind of cases of that. Uh. There's a one of the heavy class features. One of their, one of their final class features is the uh, Aegis rig, which is like a a mech suit, um, and that like gives you tons of armor and shields, and it also lets you add your piloting bonus to your fighting checks. So like if you're a good pilot and a good fighter, or you don't even have to be a good fighter if you're a good pilot, <laughs> just you can you can kind of use that instead of your of your fighting bonus. So you can still be a competent melee combatant. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just one of those things that I, that is gonna come to mind for me because well, when you when when you um are designing a game that's gonna be that's gonna be built around a variety of entries with science fiction, well, science fiction is is a very wide net to cast. Yeah, <laughs> gotta have your mechs in there somewhere. Um, I wasn't even going for full on mech. 
or full on mechs. I mentioned I mentioned power armor in that case. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So uh, power armor, uh, like the Aegis rig, is definitely like the most powerful kind of power armor, I guess. Um. But you can also just, I would consider if you have shields and armor at the same time, that kind of like qualifies as power armor to me. Uh. But if you want to, if you wanted to like make you better at fighting then the, the aegis rig is the way to go or if you want to go bigger than that there's actually a, a module uh one of the robotics modules that you can install in your vehicles is called long arms um and that's just like a big set of robot arms that you can install in your vehicle um and that actually lets you use your your fighting skill to fight through your vehicle um so if you have long arms installed in your vehicle you can you can convert it into a humanoid mech mm -hmm. now with that with that in mind when it come i did see that there's a that in the animating section there's a little bit of mat of material on the on the setting itself um but one one thing that I'm curious about, especially since we're dealing with a interstellar kind of place, how do you handle FTL? Right. So, well, the game is called Light Speed after all. So, mm -hmm. uh, faster than light travel is definitely a big part of the game. Um, yeah. So, uh, to travel between star systems, you need a special module, which is called an L drive. Um, and L drives take a special kind of fuel called uh, deuterium cells. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, if you want to jump beyond light speed, uh, then you have to pop a deuterium cell into your L drive, and then that lets you travel to to any other uh, solar system in the galaxy. Um, and the the content that's in the animating section is kind of just like a little example, um, but. There's a whole galaxy built out uh, for for light speed. It's called it's called Regnum, um, mm -hmm. and it has it has six unique uh, civilizations that all kind of have different relationships with one another. They all have numerous like sub factions, uh, criminal elements. Uh, they all have different kind of values and like approaches to the economy and culture and crime and justice and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, traveling between between stars can kind of take you from like the the dystopian apex corporations domain all the way across the galaxy to like say the militaristic Chikari Empire, um, or you know anywhere else. There's there's a lot of options for where to go in Regnum, and I'm I'm looking to kind of release some some campaign settings uh, sometime in the future that give you like a really in-depth look at a lot of these different cultures because the the lore and the setting of Lightspeed is arguably the thing I've spent the most time working on. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. it's very detailed. Uh, I could, I'd could i be happy to go further into that if you're curious. Um, when, it com when it comes to that, the... I didn't. I didn't put too much focus on on that because because of how I because of how I'd be essentially flying blind with with parts of it, given right. what given what info I do have. Mm -hmm. uh, but would it be fair of me to say that even with even with the quote unquote default setting, uh, there's it sounds like there's ro there's room to accommodate different types of genres within SF. So there's that understanding that it's still a wide net. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Although... so <laughs> oh, like the, the 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 galaxy itself, like the the big galaxy of Regnum that I was describing definitely mm -hmm. has like each civilization kind of takes on a different genre in some ways. It's it's not always that like cut and dry, like clean and black and white and simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh um or blue yeah, and like red you... for those bio, for those few Bioware fans left. Yeah. Um, yeah, but like even within each civilization, there's kind of some variety, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like genre-wise. Um, out of curiosity, have you given thought to putting in a a random planet generator within the book? 
It's funny you should mention that, actually. Uh, one of my friends helped me create a, a random setting generator quite recently. I could send you a link to that. Um, it's not necessarily a planet generator. It can it actually includes that type of location as one of the things it randomizes. So it could be a, a planet or a space station or like a lunar colony, an asteroid colony, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's available on, on itch.io as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I do see. I do see that on that on the list. And while it, it's it's certainly far, it's certainly more ex, more extensive than what I was thinking. I was just thinking of a means of generating um, planets at random, since obviously you can't map out every planet in the galaxy in one book. Yeah, that would be a, a pretty big task for sure. I mean, you could try, but then you'd have a book so big that it could probably count as an offensive weapon. <laughs> yeah. Yep. But enough about Hero System 6th Edition. <laughs> now, taking all that into account, the quick start was around 80 pages. What are you, what are you planning on for the page count for the full book? Are you thinking it's going to be around 150 or something? Um, so the the current version of the Ultimate Edition that I have is uh, 110 pages, but that's before like the final formatting and stuff. So it's probably going to end up being a little longer than that once we mm -hmm. put in all the art and everything's all nicely organized. Um, yeah, the the main difference between the free version and the Ultimate Edition is the six new alien races and the two new classes um mm -hmm. so other than that there's not like a crazy amount of new stuff um but there will be additional content after that released in the animator's guide and hopefully the campaign settings and stuff like that i yeah i can certainly get that and with that in mind what would you be shooting for as far as a release window uh for the ultimate edition um, yeah, not a yeah. date per se, but a ballpark estimate. Right. So the the Kickstarter's uh, it's open right now, uh, and it it's open until uh, December fifteenth, and we're hoping to get all those uh, uh, rewards fulfilled by January. So um, once the Kickstarter is complete and all the backers have the rewards, then I think we're going to hope to. Uh, like release the ultimate edition for you know the general audience uh for anyone who wants it uh, i don't know if we're going to do that on itch or drive through rpg or uh how exactly we're going to release that uh but yeah it'll definitely be available um yeah probably around january as well mm -hmm. all, all right now i'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops but with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. It's been a pleasure. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for having me. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!